my name is Mitch Yell. I'm from the University of South Carolina, and uh, I've been there for 25 years, although I'm actually from the Midwest. I'm from Minnesota. Uh, what I do is I'm a professor at the University of South Carolina. My area is special education. My interest is been special education law, and as we were, I was doing a session yesterday, and and someone said, I can't remember exactly how they put it, and he said, boy, you're really a nerd when it comes to this stuff, aren't you? And I said, yeah, I'm proud of it, too. I really like talking about law, but probably more so than most people, but uh, I find it fascinating. And uh, what I'm going to talk about today is Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. And I think that's a, it's a real important law. Uh, we have to pay attention to it. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today about what five, 504 is and what it isn't, and although it's kind of hard to get a grasp on, people seem to have a little difficulty understanding it. Um, I think if there's one key concept you get out of this law, there's one key concept if you understand, you understand this law perfectly. So we'll talk about that, um, talk a little bit about the requirements of the law, especially with respect to providing faith, because free appropriate public education is also a requirement of Section 504, just as it, as it is for IDEA, although it's a little bit different. And I'll also talk about things like who is protected under this law and things of that nature. And some there's some hot issues we have nowadays. Uh, right now, we're seeing a lot of cases and hearings, because 504, you can have hearings on bullying and, and students, 504 students. That's a big issue. Another one is sports part participation. So there's a lot of interesting issues regarding 504 um, that are the gist of, gist of hearings and things like that. So we'll talk about that. But first what I want to do is talk about what 504 is and then again what it isn't. Um, because I believe if, if you understand what it is, you kind of, it's easier to understand all the requirements of the law. And first off, um, Section 504 has actually predated the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which was passed in 1975. This law was passed in 1973. So it's been with us longer than 504. I mean, it, it, longer than IDEA, but it has not really kind of taken off and grabbed attention until the 90s, even though it had been around for a long time. What it is is really a brief but very powerful civil rights law. And that's different from the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act because what I said about that law is that's what we call a program law. It contains money. Um, the, when IDEA was originally passed and called the Education for All Handicapped Children Act back in 1975, um, Congress essentially got states to buy into that law and pass their own ar versions of the law like Article 7 that mirrored the law by offering funding to the states. 40% of funding, and as Tara knows, it probably never reached much more than 15%, if, you know, and normally not that much. So, but nevertheless, that's how the states got special education, got, or the, how the federal government got states to buy into special ed is by offering money and say, pass your own laws and do what we say, and they did. 504 is a different beast. It's a, it's a civil rights law, um, and as a result, it doesn't matter what states have or passed, we have to follow civil rights law. So it's brief, but it's real powerful. It also extends um, all kinds of, per or extends a lot of protection to persons at all ages um, with disabilities. The same kind of protections as um, our Congress extended in previous laws to persons discriminated based because of race or sex. Um, it's also monitored by the United States Department of Education. Uh, the U.S. Department of Education has their own, a branch within the, uh, in the department called the Office of Civil Rights. That is the office that's in charge of monitoring and enforcing Section 504. Um, so those are the important things to understand about what it is. Now, a civil rights law is a guarantee of civil rights to all persons, and it protects people from discrimination. Now, this is Section 504. Now, that isn't part of Section 504. It's all of Section 504. So there's not a lot here. 
What it says is no other qual otherwise qualified person uh, with a disability in the United States shall solely by reason of his or her disability be excluded from participation in, denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any federal program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Now, look at that, which was signed by President Nixon in 1973. Look at that and remember those words, no otherwise qualified person, excluded from, denied, subject to discrimination in uh, programs or activities re receiving federal financial assistance. This is Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. No person in the United States shall on the ground of race, color, or national origin be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. That was signed into law by Lyndon Johnson in 1964. That's the law when we think of civil rights laws, that's what we think of usually. But notice the difference between these two. There's no difference except on the grounds of race, color, and national origin, this one on the grounds of disability. This is Title IX of the Education Amendments, 1972, also signed into law by Richard Nixon. We hear a lot about this nowadays, but uh, no person in the United States shall on the basis of sex be excluded from participation in being denied the benefits of or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So, you see, these are the same things, basically. They just change the protected races, or the protected classes, I should say, of people. This protects a class of persons with disabilities. It's not just about students, although we're concerned with it re with respect to students, but it's about every person. So, if you teach in a public school and you have a disability, you're covered by this law, too. Um, so it covers everyone. So you see, the, the difference between these civil rights laws is just in the protected class of people who it protects. So we have uh, sex, race, color, national origin, disability. Now, Section 504 sister statute is the Americans with Disabilities Act. Now, if you look at that, it's a little bit different in its language but it says no covered entity shall discriminate against a qualified individual on the basis of disability in regard to job application procedures, hiring, advancement, or discharge of employees, employee compensation, job training, and other terms, conditions, and privileges of employment signed by President Bush, the first President Bush in 1980. This is called the sister statute because it protects persons with disabilities these people with this persons with disabilities are protected in any agency receiving federal financial assistance like public schools public colleges private colleges any entity that receives any type of financial assistance so if you have a child if there are students going to a private university on Pell grants or they're receiving federal funding through grants even though it's a private university like Vanderbilt or whatever, it's, it's also covered under uh, 504. And uh, ADA, or Americans with Disabilities Act, just extends this outwards to agencies that don't necessarily have federal financial funding, um, like um, government agencies, for instance, are, are covered under this. And this is mostly with respect to hiring and jobs, so oftentimes counselors will work with students who have a disability and say and talk about Americans with Disabilities Act and and tell them about that because that will protect them f against discrimination in the employment world if they're in a in a private uh, setting or a covered entity so this also applies to schools but it doesn't add anything really to 504 so the only the law we're really concerned with is 504 but know this that the ADA also applies especially Title II um, and that can apply to private preschools as well. Now um, what it isn't is a special ed law. F Section 504 is about prohibiting discrimination. It's not about giving funding. Um, it's not about special ed students. Uh, it is in essence it would be more accurate to say it's a general education law because it's about all students with disabilities, whether or not they're covered under the idea. Um, it also includes, like I said, adults. 
Um, also, this law, um, actually like the idea, doesn't guarantee results. What it does is guarantee equal opportunities. Uh, and it is not optional. This is not something folks have a choice in. They have to honor this law. It's a civil rights law. It applies to every organization receiving federal financial funding, which, of course, public schools do. So public schools are, are, are uh, covered. Uh, public private schools are covered, but private, private schools, public, or private preschools are also covered, but that's by the ADA. Uh, on, and all secondary schools are covered. Now, uh, that's what it isn't. Now, 504, it's been kind of an interesting law because although this law was passed two years before the uh, then Education for All Handicapped Children Act was passed, didn't garner a lot of attention, probably until the 90s. And the reasons for that are the emergence of disabilities like ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder that are not categories under the idea, but they are covered under this law. Um, additionally, in, the 80, in 1980, the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act created quite a stir, um, and people started looking then at 504, its sister statute. Also, the Office of Civil Rights has become much more involved in enforcing the law, enforcing 504. Um, in fact, uh, last, uh, no, was it the last year of the Obama administration, um, Arne Duncan, before he stepped down as the Department of Education, essentially said, was, he was very concerned about the problem of bullying. And he said the Office of Civil Rights is going to be much more aggressive in, a, in addressing issues of bullying in schools. So, and and that can, that's also a, a potentially a big issue under 504. Also, increased parental awareness of the law and use, and, and use of the law. Uh, that um, although under IDEA, you know, we have due process hearings and, and they, uh, parents can go to court, same thing under 504. They, they could have a hearing under 504. So uh, there has been increased parental use. Parents can also file complaints with the Office of Civil Rights, and that's really been picking up steam, certainly since the, since the 90s. And they may come out and, um, and inve do an investigation in your school. So that's a possibility. So the increased parental awareness and use and the enforcement have also uh, been a big deal. Now, if we look back at the, uh, the statute of Section 504 here, uh, there's a couple things that are important. No otherwise qualified individual shall solely by the reason of his or her disability be excluded from participation and denied the benefits of, of or be subject to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. That, as I said, like the idea, like I should say Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, like uh, Title IX of the Education Amendments, it is a civil rights mandate. Prohibits discrimination. The responsibility not to discriminate applies to all school personnel, teachers, special administrators, principals, cafeteria workers, counselors, bus drivers, all have the responsibility not to discriminate. But the primary responsibility falls on district and school level administrators and general education teachers. Now, I think the key to really understanding this law is to understand what it prohibits, and that is discrimination. Now, school personnel may not discriminate against students with disabilities. Um, that includes, like I said, everyone. Other students, students can discriminate against other students with disabilities. Uh, administrators, teachers, parents, staff, anybody can discriminate. Um, and that exists any time a student is excluded or treated differently or in an inferior manner because of his or her disability. Now, people think of discrimination as a bad thing and people often as ascribe evil motives to discrimination or bad motives to discrimination. In fact, under 504, discrimination is usually not because of bad motives it's bec or, or purposeful actions that arise from some animus or bad feelings. 
it's defined in terms of specific actions that are prohibited and often or not more often than not what you see when you look at o OC o Office of Civil Rights, I'll just call it OCR rulings, is that usually nobody means to discriminate, but they do. They just don't understand the requirements of the law, and because of that they discriminate, which essentially means we deny comparable opportunities uh, to youngsters with disabilities. Now, um, in the last, uh, the last, uh, session we did, I explained the case of Doe v. Withers, and just to make a long story short, it, wound up, it was a social studies teacher who failed to honor parts of the IEP. Because as he said, um, my class is a level playing field. Everybody is treated the same. Well, the whole idea behind Section 504 is people with disabilities uh, the protected class of people with disabilities, the protected class of different races, national origin, sex, um, don't necessarily have a level playing field. Think of this in terms of persons with disabilities. Our students are not on a level playing field. And the idea of Section 504 is to level the playing field by providing comparable opportunities to, for them. And that may, may include educational programming, free appropriate public education, all those sorts of things. Now, uh, specific actions that school districts, I've looked at a lot of OCR rulings and oftentimes um, the specific actions that schools engage in is not done purposefully, but it, in effect it denies a student an opportunity to participate in, benefit from, any aid or program or service that the school district offers. So you could also discriminate by offering a student an aid, benefit, or service that is not equal to or effective as that afforded to other students. So for example, the whole issue of FAPE, free appropriate public education under Section 504 is uh, because of their disability, they're not on a level playing field. So what we have to do is level the playing field through our provisions of providing a free and appropriate public education. So it's all about making certain kids have comparable opportunities. Um, it's also about making what are called non-fundamental changes to ensure access to programs. Um, and I can give you a couple examples. Um, I will use uh, an example at, that uh, actually happened in Minnesota uh, involved a young youngster with disabilities who attended a high school and everyone in 10th grade had to take a chemistry class, a, a chemistry lab. Uh, and we had a, the, this particular school, which is an old high school in Minneapolis, had a, a chemistry lab on the third floor. And it was a very well-equipped chemistry lab. Unfortunately, the school was so old that it had no elevators, it had no uh, ways for persons in wheelchairs to get up to the third floor, get, literally unless someone would, would carry them up. Um, they were sued, uh, they, were, it was, they were brought to a hearing, actually it was a complaint under 504 in this particular case, because they had a lab that was not accessible to youngsters with disabilities. They had to figure out how to make it accessible, but the building was so old that it really wasn't practical to put in an elevator. So that would have been a fundamental change because it was an old building, not subject to 504, so they didn't have to make that type of change. But nevertheless, they had to make a change that would allow youngsters with disabilities to access a chemistry lab. What this particular school did is they built a lab on the first floor for youngsters with disabilities who could not access. And there weren't many. There were two or three students that couldn't, so they made them a special lab on the first floor. But unfortunately, the lab on the third floor, well-equipped, Bunsen burners, I mean, it had everything. The first floor lab had two Bunsen burners, and that was it. So it was not a comparable facility. So again, 
they had to level the playing field, but they, had, they did not do that. Uh, so they, would, they had to come up with other means, and essentially it was to make, the, what they chose to do was make that first floor lab as complete a lab as the third floor lab. So that's where fundamental changes and comparability uh, come into play. Some other, other ways uh, that schools can discriminate is by using double standards for eligibility for non-academic programs. And um, okay, I can give you an example from a school I taught in. We had, uh, when I was, in, was teaching in an elementary school, one of the things, I'm from Minnesota, one of the things Minnesota, all sixth graders take Minnesota history. Everybody does that. I don't know if your kids have to take Indiana history, but our kids had to take Minnesota history. Every sixth grader at the end of the unit got to go to the you know, St. Paul, were bused to St. Paul, and they went to the state capitol, where they tour the capitol and see where laws are made and all those kind of things. So it was, it was, it was really interesting. And I still remember that um, in our school, what the principal did is, because we had a program for youngsters with emotional behavioral disorders, who, you know, I mean, they're not the greatest kids to have on a field trip sometime. Well, the principal made a, a priori decision that no child with an emotional behavioral disorder was cag uh, uh, categorized as EBD could go on this field trip. That was a double standard. So, in other words, because solely because of the child's disability of emotional behavioral disorders, they were denied equal opportunity. That would been that was a violation under Section 504. Now, clearly, we all know that uh, the kids had real, pro you know, kids with emotional behavioral disorders can have can be problems. And so, what we needed to do is that was illegal to say you can't go. It would have been le illegal to say, for example, that everyone, all students can go to this program if they earn so many points or, or something like that. And if the child who's EBD didn't earn points and didn't go, that would have been okay as long as that also applied to non-disabled students. Because see, you're treating everyone the same. They're on a level playing field. But because they didn't do that, the, this principal is treating youngsters with disabilities in a discriminatory manner. He didn't mean to do it, but he did discriminate against the students who had emotional behavioral disorders. Uh, failing to ensure that a general ed program meets a Section 504 student's needs as adequately as the needs of non-disabled students are met. Um, I gave you the example of the chemistry lab in Minneapolis at Roosevelt High School. Uh, they didn't have a, a lab that was comparable on the first floor. It was quite inferior to the, to the real lab on the third floor. So in essence, the kids were not getting comparable opportunity. Um, their education was not, is a, not adequate as a non-disabled student's education was with respect to chemistry lab. And that's kind of where the idea of FAPE comes from, is this idea of the education has to be adequate. They have to be on that level playing field. Now sometimes with kids with disabilities, we have to do, some, we have to do things to get them up to a level playing field. And that's what FAPE is all about. It's about providing educational services that are as adequate as those, as those services we provide to non-disabled students. Now, currently the biggest issue under Section 504 is harassment and bullying based on disability. Uh, and there's many, many examples uh, in, in OCR of complaints regarding disability-based bullying. Now, what is disability-based bullying? Um, let's say there was, a, there was a kind of quite a famous OCR ruling a couple of years ago about a young girl with Down syndrome who uh, had to rode a regular bus to school every day and was harassed on the bus and they would call her retard and a lot of other names that were not very appropriate but they were bullying her based on her disability. They were bullying her because she had a disability. Well that's discrimination. 
I mean, and it's hard, you know, to what we as educators have to do in a case like that when we see that occurring is we have to investigate and we have to do something about it. Now, uh, that doing something about it may involve things like disciplining the bullier, um, counseling for the students who are bullying, and taking any actions to make certain it doesn't happen again. And if we don't do that, that's where we can be, uh, we can be discriminating. And there are a number of cases in which that have gone, into, gone to the courts in which uh, parents have held that school districts knew about disability-based bullying but didn't do anything about it. And in, the, and in a number of those cases, school districts have gotten clobbered by OCR or been investigated and given, told what they have to do because that, that was considered to be discriminatory. So bullying is a, is a big issue now too. Um, that's probably the biggest amount of cases and hearings we see under 504 has to do with bullying occurring based on a child's disability. Now the school has to do something about it. It's when school districts don't do anything about it, don't follow up, don't investigate, don't take any actions, that's when they may be guilty of discrimination. So that's a real big issue now. Um, also, uh, students uh, who are covered uh, are quite, are, are, there are more students covered under 504 than are covered under the idea. And the, the, what I'm going to talk about now are the regulations. The, the, as I said, 504 is, is only a paragraph. There's not much there. But the department of what happens when a law is passed, and this happened when the idea was passed, it happens when the education or the No Child Left Behind, now the uh, Every Student Succeeds Act was passed, is Congress delegates a certain amount of their uh, power, uh, in essence, to an administrative agency to do what's called promulgating regulations or writing regulations that help us as educators see how, uh, understand how to implement the law. And... Um, what, the, what I'm going to be talking about now are the regulations that were drawn up by the Office of Civil Rights in the Department of Education regarding who is covered under this law. And as you'll see, when we think about the law that most of us are, are quite acquainted with, which is the idea, who does that cover? Well, that covers kids having one of 13 disability categories and who, because of that disability, being, having that disability, require special ed. But this is, is quite different. This is who is covered under this law. Um, any otherwise qualified person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities has a record of such impairment or is regarded as having such an impairment. The first thing to notice there is the other, otherwise qualified. What does that mean? Well, for purposes of education, it doesn't mean much. It doesn't mean much at all because as applied to elementary schools and secondary schools, a qualified person just means the child's of school age. That's it. Now, it can mean quite a bit when we talk about other aspects of education like uh, engage or being involved in sporting activities. Then that takes on a different meaning. But just for purposes of education, it just means any child between the ages of whatever the state, whoever the, whatever age the state provides public schooling for is covered under this law. Now, a physical impairment is defined in this way. And a few years ago, um, in one of the reauthorizations of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, actually during the Clinton administration, um, there was an attempt to use this definition, change, take this defini definition, that definition, I should say, and use that with idea too, which really would have enlarged the number of students who are covered under idea. But who is covered first off? Otherwise, qualified just means they have to be of school age. Physical impairment is defined as any physiological disorder or condition, cosmetic disfigurement, or anatomical loss affecting one or more body systems. And then the regulations for both Section 504 and the ADA provide a whole list 
of different types of physical impairments, such as epilepsy, AIDS, HIV, allergies, arthritis, heart disease, Tourette's syndrome, cerebral palsy, visual impairment, broken limbs, cancer, diabetes, hemophilia, episodic conditions, and conditions in remission. That's just, that, that's just a list that OCR provided in the regulations as examples. That's not an exhaustive list, um, but that's included. So you can see there's a lot of folks, kids in that list, who are, would not probably be under IDEA because they're not in one of the 13 disability categories. Now, some could be, but uh, others, it's, it's less likely. But nevertheless, any of these physiological disorders or others can, be qual can qualify under I 504. Now, the, the second part is physical or mental impairment. Now, a mental impairment is any mental or psychological disorder such as intellectual disability, organic brain disorder, emotional or mental illness, and specific learning disability. And this is the list of non-exhaustive lists of examples. ADD, ADHD, which of course is not a category under IDEA. Um, they certainly can be served, but it's not a category by itself, although a number of organizations over the years have tried desperately to get that a category added to IDEA and have not been successful yet, but ADHD kids are clearly covered under 504. Uh, reading disability, depression, eating disorder, behavior disorder, past drug or alcohol addiction, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. Now, these are just examples. Quite literally, are you, if it, is anybody here familiar, I've seen the, I know you have Tara, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the APA. Quite literally, every disorder in that category could qualify for 504. So you see what it does is it really, it throws out quite a broad um, net. Now, let me go back for a second. So it can be a lot of kids that are not necessarily served under IDEA. Now, the last important thing is for a child to have a di disability under 504, they have to have that be otherwise qualified, which is of school age. They have to be, uh, have a mental or physical impairment, such as those we've talked about. Additionally, that, that, Im that impairment has to affect a major life activity, or I should say one or more major life activities. Well, so what, uh, what are they? The major life activities are an important thing. Remember, IDEA requires that for a child to be determined to be eligible as a child with a disability, they have to fit into one of those 13 disability categories. And they have to need special ed. In other words, their educational performance is such, because of their disability, they need special education-related services. It's somewhat the same with uh, Section 504, but it's that broad mental or physical disability, but that physical disability or mental disability or impairment also has to, has to affect a major, one or more major life activities. Now, but look at the list of major life activities. Learning, which is what we usually consider in schools, is one such uh, major life activity. But there's also breathing, walking, talking, seeing, hearing, concentrating. That's a major life activity. So let's say we have a child with ADHD who's clearly covered under mental physical impairment, but they're doing just fine in school. Learning is not impacted, but is concentrating? Is, it, is their ability to concentrate impacted? Uh, any other, all these other areas, they're all major life activities. So that again is a very broad activity, very broad definition. Because remember what IDEA says, they must need special ed. This just says may, one or more major life activity is impacted because of it. Now, the substantially limit uh, essentially means it must be a, an important limitation of a major life activity. Now, OCR ever saw OCR and actually that's the organization or those are the folks in the US Department of Education who monitor compliance with uh, the uh, with section 504 
There's also a department of, uh, uh, they're called the Office of Rehabilitative Service and Special Ed Services, or Office of Special Ed and Rehabilitative Services, called OCR, that monitors compliance with the IDEA. Now, both organizations frequently do things called issuing guidance. Uh, if you go on to, you Googled OCEPT guidance letters, you, the first hit will be on different guidance letters issued year by year by the office of uh, by OSERS. You can do the same thing for OCR. And what these guidance letters or memorandum do uh, is they give guidance to school district officials in this case uh, and administrators on how OCR interprets this law is to be followed. OCR in a memorandum which was actually called a Dear Colleague Letter, because they address these letters Dear Colleague often. Um, in an OCR memorandum, substantial was interpreted to mean an important and material limitation, and that it must be made on an individual basis. And it's not an easy task, but it's critical to deciding eligibility. And actually, this was a, a letter, uh, if you want to write a letter to OCR and ask a question, you can and it likely may wind up being published. And that letter from a, a superintendent named McKeithen in 1994 was published where he said, what does that mean to be substantially uh, limited? And they just said, well, it means an important limitation, which doesn't really define it that well, but that's what it means. And we have to, we as educators have to make that decision in determining if a child is eligible for services under 504. And the best way to do that is compare kids to non-disabled kids and say, is that limit pretty substantial? Is it really quite different from general ed kids or non-disabled kids? Now, um, so, if we go back, there it is, no otherwise qualified individual with a disability, not a big deal because that means school age, solely by reason of his or her disability be excluded from, denied uh, benefits of, subject to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Now, um, there are actually three parts of this definition. Um, if you recall when I said, uh, it can mean a physical or mental impairment of a major life activity, or a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. That was the definition I gave. But if you look back at the slide, and I went to the wrong slide, but the slide on physical or mental impairment, it says presence of a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity or has a record of such an impairment or is regarded as having such an impairment. So that essentially means that if a kid has the, has, if we determine they have a disability, they're covered under 504. But if they had a record of disability, they're covered under 504. If they're regarded as having a disability, they're protected under 504. And what does that mean, regarded as? Now, let's just say a child has a cosmetic facial disfigurement and they're treated as if they had a disability, even though they don't have a disability. They're, they're covered under this law. Both these parts are covered under this law, but only with respect to discrimination. The only kids who have the right to a FAPE are those kids. The kids we determine have physical or mental impairment that substantially limit a major life activity. Now, one of the things we have to do to level the playing field with those kids is provide them with a free, appropriate public education. We don't, there's th these kids with a record of uh, such an impairment or regarded as having such impairment, we still can't, we, we have to guard against discrimination against those kids, but we don't have to provide them a FAPE. And I've been in school districts where they said, uh, the 504 team said, well, little Johnny here at one time had a episodic condition, but it's in remission now, but he has a record of, therefore we have to provide a free appropriate public education to him. Actually, you don't. Only 
discrimination applies to the first, the second two. The first part is where we have to provide a fate. So if we think in terms of who all is covered by this law, we see that it's a lot more than just students. So it includes employees. If you have a disability and you're working in a school district, you're, you're protected by this law. You're also protected by, by ADA. Parents of students with disabilities are protected if they have a disability. Let's say that um, uh, a parent, uh, uh, parents who are deaf or hard of hearing want to uh, take part in the school's PTA and they go to activities and they have speakers but because they're deaf they're unable to hear or they're unable to take advantage or, uh, of the speaker so it's up to the school to do whatever they can do to ensure that they're not discriminated against which would be something like pr maybe providing a sign language interpreter. That would be an example of how, you could, how 504 would affect parents. Facilities have to be accessible. We'll talk more about that in a little, in a little while. And extracurricular activities are also covered. That's been a huge bone of contention with OCR. And they probably issued four or five guidance letters about what does that mean? Kids have to, with disabilities have to be involved in extracurricular activities, including after school sports. But if we look at the students in the school, if we kind of thought of this as that round big circle on the outside is representing all students in a school, a smaller number of students are the 504 students. These are the kids with the physical or mental impairments that substantially limit a major life activity. And then within that group, there are students in special education who are covered under the Individual with Disabilities Education Act. Essentially what this means is virtually all, 100% of the time, students who have, a, have an IEP in special ed are duly covered by Section 504. So in other words, your students with an IEP in your resource rooms or self-contained classes are also covered by Section 504. So they're doubly covered. Now, that is meaningful in a way. It's me not meaningful in another way. Um, if you have an IEP for a student, and you're honoring the IEP, you're implementing it as written, you are meeting 504. Because the requirements of IDEA are a lot, there's a lot more uh, requirements for writing an IEP and ensuring that, an that a student with disabilities under IDEA receives a FAPE. If you do that, you are automatically, you're pretty much automatically meeting 504. It's for those other students that are not covered under, fi under IDEA that they're the ones that schools usually run afoul of Section 504 when they don't provide them services that, in essence, level the playing field for them. So we're going to be talking mostly about them, but remember that IDEA students are doubly covered, but when I talk about determining eligibility under 504, developing a FAPE under 504, that doesn't also, just because kids are doubly covered, that doesn't mean we have to have an IEP and a 504 plan for every kid. You don't, because the IEP meets the requirements of 504. That doesn't mean we have to determine they're eligible under both laws, because if they're eligible under IDEA, they're also eligible under um, 504. But what 504 adds to IDEA is a non-discrimination. So we still can't, even if they're, idea, if they're IDEA students, we can't discriminate against them. That's what's added in 504. And I'll explain that more uh, as we go along. Now, the first thing we have to understand is eligibility. Like the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, we also have to determine if a child is eligible for services under Section 504. They're always um, protected against discrimination under 504. But we also have to determine if they're eligible for services and this protection against discrimination. A student must be determined, in other words. We 
have a task where we have to determine if a child with a disability, not covered under the idea, has a mental or physical impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. We have to determine if a child is eligible for services under Section 504. Now, you see why, uh, why a child with uh, an IEP is automatically covered under this law is we're saying our kids fit one of 13 disability categories, right? And because of that, they need special ed services. Well, clearly in that case, they have a physical or mental impairment, and clearly it limits major life activity because they need special ed services. So you see, IDEA kids are automatically 504 kids too, but it doesn't add anything. To what, really doesn't add anything to what we have to do. Now, let's talk a little more about eligibility. And OCR has issued a number of uh, rulings, guidance letters on eligibility. And um, no child is automatically covered under this law. Students, you know, a lot of people say students who are referred to special ed, but they don't meet special ed requirements. Are they automatically 504 students? No, not necessarily. You still have to make that determination. Do they have a mental or physical impairment that it substantially limits a major life activity? Now, a lot, how about mitigating measures? Let's say you have a child with epilepsy, and clearly they have a physical or mental impairment that limits a major life activity, but what if they're taking medication that alleviates or controls their epilepsy? Are they still, do they still have a disability? Or how about a kid with ADHD um, who's taking Concerta? And because of that Concerta, he is just great. Is, does he have a disability under 504? Because there are what are called mitigating measures that make their condition kind of Alle alle not, not ameliorate, but sort of alleviate their, their um, particular disability. So if he's, when little Johnny's on his concerti, he's great. Does that mean he's not a 504 student? No, because you cannot consider mitigating factors. This came, uh, there's a number of cases in the, in the Supreme Court uh, a few years ago that said, yeah, you could consider mitigating factors. And what Congress did Congress didn't do that. They went back and said, Supreme Court, you're wrong. You can't, people cannot consider mitigating factors. They put that in the law. So we can't consider mitigating factors in determining eligibility. So if you ever hear someone say, well, yeah, uh, little Dale does have ADHD, and he does, just a little bit though, um, and because of that, he's not qualified. That's not right. Because, because just because of a dis because of a, of a medicine, medicine that he's taking. He's still a 504 student. A couple other questions. Is there a dual eligibility under IDEA in Section 504? Yes. Because a student who qualifies under IDEA pretty much automatically also uh, is covered under 504. And they're entitled to the protections of 504 but the, the service and the services, but remember by having an IEP that's, that you, the IEP team develops and that's implemented as written, you're more than meeting the requirements of 504. Now, and here's a big issue OCR has, had to deal, deal, has been dealing with for many years. That is, can parents opt only for services under 504 when their child is IDEA eligible. And I remember this when I was teaching 16 years ago. Parents came in and said, yeah, you know, little Johnny is, he qualifies for IDEA, but I don't want him to have IDEA services. I want him to be served under 504. According to OCR, that's not true. Parents cannot make that request. Because if they turn down an, I, uh, an IEP, essentially they're turning down a 504 plan too. So they said parents cannot make that, cannot say that. And vice versa is also true. Um, now the prohibition against discrimination always applies, but FAPE doesn't. So if the parent turns down FAPE under IDEA, essentially they're turning down FAPE under 504. 
That's what, that's what OCR says, and so that's, that's the way it is. They can't make that, that request. They can make the request, but according to OCR, it doesn't have to be honored. And I remember that was when I was teaching, and um, a little after, but that was a real common thing when I was teaching. Parents coming in saying, I don't want an IEP, um, but I want a 504 plan. And my, my question was, uh, why would you want to do that? Because the child usually doesn't, they don't have nearly the rights that they do under IDEA, but OCR said you can't do that anyway. So, yep. Now, we talked about this already, but what are the prongs having a record of such an impairment or regarded as having such an impairment mean? That essentially means when people treat kids without disabilities as if they have a disability, or people treat kids who had a disability as if they still have a disability when they don't. Um, that those kids who are had a record of but no longer have an impairment defined by 504 or they're regarded as even though they don't have an impairment those kids are protected from discrimination however they have no right to receive a fate because they don't have a disability that qualifies them to have the level the playing field leveled by getting a 504 plan now that's kind of a complicated thing. People get that? No, can you say that again? Okay. Um, the law says if we went back and looked at the definition by OCR, it says that an otherwise qualified uh, individual who has a physical or mental dis uh, impairment that substantially limits a major life activity or had a record of such impairment or is regarded as having such impairment. Said could all qualify under 504. Well that's true, but if they've had a record of but no longer have such an impairment, or they're just regarded as having a impairment and don't have one at all, they're protected from discrimination. You can't discriminate against them, but they're not entitled to a 504 plan because they don't have a dis, they don't have, right now they don't have a disability. Does that kind of, I mean, it's kind of a difficult thing, I think, to get, a, get, your, get your head around. Okay, we're going to have the break at 2.15. Okay, uh, just, just uh, what I'm going to talk about next uh, is requirements of Section 504. What does it require of those of, uh, of, of us working in school districts? What I want to now talk about now is Section 504 requirements and uh, talk mostly about probably the free appropriate public education part or FAPE, but there's also some other requirements that 504 has that are very much like IDEA. One of them is child fine. That, you know, under IDEA, we all school districts have an affirmative duty to locate children with disabilities uh, who may qualify under, uh, for special ed. And if they have a suspicion, that they do have a disability and need special ed services based on the, this child find they have to do an evaluation. Uh, 504 has a child find uh, obligation for school districts too where they have to conduct an, an annual effort to identify and locate kids with disabilities that reside in the district's jurisdiction. Uh, and then if they find kids and they believe they may uh, qualify for 504 services, they have to conduct an evaluation. And we'll talk more about the evaluation in a little while. Um, LEA personnel or parents may initiate a referral uh, for 504, but also school districts do screening, public awareness activities, referrals, and that nature. But the essential message is they have an affirmative duty to find kids with disabilities. The interesting thing, by the way, here is colleges and universities and technical schools once a child is out of high school, 504 still applies, but they can't go looking for kids with disabilities. So universities say, our university, we cannot, by law, look for kids with disabilities. They have to find us. They have to come to us. And every, virtually every uh, university, college, secondary school, community college will have uh, that receives federal financial assistance will have something on the, on the lines of a office for 
disabled student services or something like that. And that's the entity that uh, helps them, uh, for example, uh, I had a student with a disability in a class um, last year and I was contacted by, and it's called, it's kind of, it's not, it's the Office of Disabled Student Services, not People First Language, but that's the office's name. They contacted me, said, we have a, a student with a disability in your class. These are the modifications uh, they requested that I do. And they said, um, for one of the modifications this, this student has is time and a half on their tests because he had ADHD. Uh, and so um, I would send the student to the office for testing and give, give them the test beforehand and they'd test the child, the student, and give them an hour, uh, where my tests were an hour long, they'd give them an hour and a half. So, but, the, but they have to identify themselves. So if you have a child with a disability who's going into a post-secondary school, they have to advocate for themselves. They have to ask for the services. They have to identify themselves. And that Office of Disability Services also has to determine eligibility. Although it's a little different uh, than it is for uh, those of us in, in public schools. What they can do is they could, a lot of times people will bring in 504 plans they've had in high school or IEPs they've had in high school, uh, an Office of Disabled Student Services could say, well, that's not enough. We need more. That would, that would be fine if they do that. But for us, we have to identify them. Now, in terms of the evaluation, uh, OCR has concluded that prior parental consent is needed to conduct an evaluation. So if you're if your child find activities, you've determined a child has a disability uh, and, under, and maybe qualify under 504, you have to do an evaluation. Now the law, neither the law nor the regulations say anything about parental consent. But OCR has said you have to do that in their guidance letters. So the best thing, if you're doing a 504 evaluation, contact the parents and, and get their permission. Also, students must be individually evaluated before they be, can, can be classified as having a, you know, a 504 disability or physical or mental impairment. Um, and the eligibility process is somewhat similar to as the IDEA process. I mean, we have to have tests. We, we have to use multiple tests. We can't just use one test. The tests have to be validated. Um, they have to reflect the student's aptitude or achievement, not merely the presence of a disability. And OCR has issued a number of guidance letters in which they have said, these are situations in which you, we think you should be looking at conducting a 504 evaluation. Um, a student returns to school after a serious illness or injury and has been out of school for a long time. OCR says that sh you should strongly consider doing an evaluation in that case. A student shows a pattern of failing to benefit from instruction. In other words, you have a child who's failing class after class, they're not benefiting, yet they don't qualify under IDEA. OCR says you should look at doing a 504 evaluation. Uh, student exhibits signs of a chronic health condition. Some other areas, they said you have a child who's been suspended long term or expulsion is being considered. You may want to consider should a 504 evaluation be conducted. And we'll talk about discipline with 504 kids. That's a, also a, a, an interesting area. Student is referred for idea evaluation, but the team decides evaluation is not warranted. OCR says that's maybe a good time to consider it. They don't say you have to do it, but they say that's a good time to consider it. You have a child was referred to uh, the multidisciplinary team. They said, well, this child doesn't look like they qualify. Um, that may be a time to look at 504 evaluation. Or a student is value evaluated by the district and doesn't qualify after the evaluation. So the, that one is 
you've decided not to do an evaluation in the first place. This one is you've done an evaluation, the child doesn't qualify. OCR considers those both instances where you may want to do a 504 evaluation. Student is at risk or shows potential of dropping out. A student has frequent or excessive absences for uh, medical reasons or any time you suspect a disability. Those others were kind of specific situations. Now in terms of the evaluation, the uh, requirements for a 504 evaluation are pretty much the same as for an idea evaluation. They're not quite as, uh, there's not as many requirements, but it has to be conducted by a group of qualified professionals. It has to be based on information from a variety of sources. And you know, in IDEA, we have the multidisciplinary team. We have to collect a variety of, uh, use a variety of sources in determining our evaluation, or in conducting our evaluation. Same thing with 504. We must document and consider all available pertinent information. Could be information from teachers, uh, maybe if the school is an RTI system, uh, data from the RTI system. Use tests or procedures tailored to uh, access specific areas of need, and these tests should be val validated for their specific purpose, and evaluation is needed when there's a significant change in placement, and every three years. Evaluation doesn't require parental par participation, uh, reevaluation uh, where it does with IDEA. Now, there's certain, uh, OCR has answered a number of questions in the last few years. Um, regarding evaluation and one of them is there's no formula or scale that measures what a substantial limitation is because remember the, the uh, 504 says they have to have a substantial limitation of a major life one or more major life activities there's no guidance to what a substantial limitation is so essentially that's up to the team on an individualized basis you have to decide if they're limitation is substantial enough to be called a major limitation. Also, can a medical diagnosis suffice as an evaluation? No. And a lot, uh, I've heard this a lot, and OCR has had a lot of questions about this. What if a parent comes in with a medical diagnosis that says they have ADHD? Are they automatically qualified? OCR says no. This is not a medical diagnosis. They say, Oh, 504 is the educational diagnosis, so you have to be answering as educators, do they have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity? Now clearly, your medical diagnosis is going to be part of your decision, but it's not the only, it, it has to be considered, but your decision is more wide ranging than that. And I think those questions came from, uh, like I said, people coming in with, with prescriptions that said, child is ADHD and should have a 504 plan. I mean, I've seen prescriptions like that from medical doctors. Julie Weatherly talks about one time being at a, at a 504 meeting and seeing a med parent brought in this diagnosis from her doctor and said, uh, little Johnny has ADHD and should have a 5 or a 4 plan. <laughs> so, and she said, and you know, and that she used that to illustrate the fact that they don't really probably know what a 504 plan is. It's just something that the parents said. So th just because the medical doctor says they should have it, it's, it's still a decision that the team makes. Uh, a couple more questions that OCR has answered. Does a medical diagnosis automatically mean a student is qualified under 504, which I already talked about? No. The impairment must cause a substantial limitation of a major life activity. So. If a medical diagnosis is the child is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, well, that's a, probably a pretty good piece of evidence you're going to be considering. But you also have to consider, does the impairment, and use other instruments to determine that, does it cause a substantial limitation of a major life activity? Must an outside evaluation be considered? Yes, just like with IDEA. You have to consider it. You don't automatically have to accept it but you do have to consider it. Now, this is the, this is the big area uh, for those of us in education, and that is, what is a free appropriate public education for a youngster with a 504 disability only 
uh, and not an idea disability. If a child remembers in that first prong, they have a mental or physical impairment that substantially limits a major life activity, and because of that, their one and the major life activity, for example, is learning. In order to level that playing field, one way we do that is by developing a 504 plan or that 504 plan, which like an IEP, essentially becomes our free appropriate, uh, the mem uh, memorializing the free appropriate public education. Now, this is what uh, the federal courts uh, have said that the FAPE standard under Section 504 is similar to the FAPE standard under IDEA, including there's uh, procedures we have to go through. The procedures are not nearly as rigorous as they are under IDEA. Essentially, if we're going to do a FAPE, we just have to inform the parents. Um, and they, it's best if they, if they are part of the team, although that's not technically required either. The primary differences, though, is this, that under 504, what, we, what our charge is as educators is something called the adequacy or, or the comparability standard or the equivalency standard. That means that we have to level the playing field. We have to usually determine what accommodations we must make to level that playing field so that the child can be involved in the general ed education setting. Most of 504 only students are educated in general education. They don't receive special ed services. Now, they may receive related services. The law, the regulations actually say a, a FAPE under 504 could include special ed services, but they generally don't. Remember, there's no funding in this law. Uh, and, general, and, and more frequently than not, kids under, under 504 plans receive most of their services, if not all of their services, in the general education setting. And the idea being is we will level that playing field by determining what accommodations we can make to meet those, that child's need to level the playing field. And again, we always have to consider the negative prohibition against discrimination. Now, this is, this is what the regulations state, that the provision of general or special education and related services that are designed to meet the student's individual needs as adequately as the needs of students with disabilities are met. So that's quite different than the idea. You know, the idea talks about the IEP and reasonably calculated to provide educational benefit. The FAPE standard for 504 says our educational program should be comparable. We need to make accommodations to level the playing field, to make that child's education comparable with the, with a child, to the education received by the child without disabilities. Um, as I said, there are procedural requirements, but they're not nearly as specific as those of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Um, now, it almost usually includes, it may include general ed education, with accommodations or supplementary aids and services or special education and related services. Must be individually determined. Again, as the case with IDEA, 504 plans are to be individually determined based on a child's needs. And it also, there's also an LRE requirement in 504. Although, most of the time, since a child is educated in the general ed setting anyway, uh, the LRE requirement really doesn't, doesn't apply. Now, um, OCR has said that the, most, the four most frequent reasons that they find school districts violate Section 504 with respect to providing a FAPE are these four areas. One, the school district or local educational agency, LEA, has failed to identify or properly evaluate a student. So a student has a disability, they just haven't identified them. That's the number, that's the number one reason for 
I wouldn't say in order, it's, it's the number one reason OCR lists for that school districts most likely are going to deny, wind up uh, denying FAPE. Number two is the LEA has not identified the complete range of educational services and supplementary aids and services the student needs to receive a FAPE. In other words, it's kind of like in the idea we have our present levels of performance statement. One of the very important things uh, about the present levels of academic achievement and formative statement in our IEP is it must address all those needs that a child has uh, that we have to address in the rest of the IEP. That's the second major reason OCR says school districts fail to provide FAPE under 504 is they don't identify all the needs. So they don't do an appropriate evaluation uh, to identify what the child actually needs in order to be on a level playing field. Third, and this is a very important one, the LEA or the team has identified the items a child is needed to level the playing field or those accommodations the child is needed, but they failed to provide them. In the last session we were talking about the, uh, the kind of a, a new area of FAPE where parents are going and going to due process hearings saying that a school district failed to provide FAPE and it wasn't because their IEPs weren't adequate or they didn't provide benefit but it was because they, did not, they didn't implement the IEP as written. That according to OCR is one of the major reasons school districts uh, err in providing services to kids and 504 kids too is they know what services need to pro be provided but they don't do it. Or they know what accommodations should be available to a child in the mainstream setting, but they don't do it. So for example, while we talked about the Doe v. Withers case, um, that, was, that would have been a violation of 504 too, because the social studies teacher knew about the, evalu uh, the requirement of, of reading tests to the child, but he didn't do it. That would be, that's a violation of 504 too. Now that's not what that suit was about, that lawsuit was about, but it could have been. And probably the school would have found to have failed to provide a FAPE, even if the child was a 504 student. Um, also, a fourth reason OCR says that school districts fail to provide FAPE is because they develop generic 504 plans. Not based on the unique needs of a child, but just uh, a team looks at a book that has accommodations and they just say, well, that sounds good, that sounds good. They just grab a bunch of accommodations and put them in, not considering the individual needs of the child. That's the fourth major reason OCR says schools violate IDEA. That's one of the reasons I always look a little askance on lists of accommodations because not that they're bad in themselves, but it's, it's not good if teachers or, or 504 teams just uniformly say, well, yeah, we'll just take all those and put them down here. Because they have to be individually determined. So those are the four major ways that uh, school districts violate FAPE. Failing to identify in the first place, not identifying all their needs, not identifying their needs and providing and saying these are the services a child needs, but then failing to provide them, or just instead of considering a student's individual needs, developing a generic 504 plan. Now, let me give you some examples from OCR cases. An example of a FAPE violation would be failing to provide adequate staff training. Many OCR rulings have talked about staff not understanding what their responsibilities under 504 were. And that is, that's the, that's the school district problem if they don't adequately train their staff to understand when, five, when they get a 504 plan, it's, it's like an IEP. You have to honor that. And you have to make certain those, those are implemented. So adequate staff training. Equipment's another thing. You know, I gave the example of the, of the, of the high school in Minneapolis that had the lab upstairs, chemistry lab, good. One downstairs for kids with mo mobility impairments, not very good at all. They were uncom not comparable. 
equipment. It was not uh, I should say came comparable facilities, and so it was a violation of 504. And equipment was bad too. Failing to educate the 504 student in the LRE, that's usually, as I said, not going to be a problem because most of your 504 students tend to be educated in general education only. Um, failing to provide related services and you know reasons like, oh, they were unavailable, too expensive. It's just like as if we, if we have a 504 plan with related services, which we could have. Say you had a child and you provided um, counseling services one day a week uh, one day a week for 20 minutes on anger c control or something like that, and you didn't provide it, that could be a, that would, under idea, that would be a real problem. That's also a problem under 504. Or if you have some particular type, you decide the child needs some particular type of assistive technology, and you write that in the 504 plan, but you don't provide it. That's an example of related services. Failing to carry out agreed uh, upon recommendations to address behavior of a student. And this could actually apply to any, any area. So if it's agreed upon in the 504 plan, it may as well be like it's like being in an IEP. It has to be honored. Failing to provide students with disabilities with properly trained teachers. There have been a number of OCR rulings uh, regarding training of teachers because teachers not being prepared to work with students with disabilities because they're you know often general ed teachers they're they have 504 students and they don't really understand the nature of the disability and then oh by the way in failing to carry out provisions of an IEP that can also the, the, for an IEP ch child in special ed with an IEP if you fail to carry out the provisions of the IEP, well that's a violation of FAPE under IDEA. It's also a 504 violation. Because remember they're doubly covered. Our IDEA students are doubly covered. And that, so that would be a 504 um, violation also. Failing to give a student with disabilities the services listed in their 504 plan. Failing to provide the full amount of services called for in the IEP or 504 plan, shorten the school day without considering the needs of the student. Shorten school days with 504 students. Have There have been rulings where OCR has said that's a denial of FAPE. So it just as it would be with a student with uh, disabilities who was uh, in special education. Now, uh, the primary way that we ensure a FAPE for students, 504 students, is through our 504 plan, just as we would special ed kids through their IEP. So after a student has be, been determined to be eligible, a team of individuals develops and implements a Section 504 plan. Now, the plan, just like an IEP, is designed to meet the unique educational needs of the child. And there should be some sort of measurable criteria for determining success. Now, not to the extent of the idea, you know, with the, the annual measurable annual goals and progress monitoring, 504 doesn't require that, but it does require that we do monitor a child's progress. This is not specific about how exactly we do that, but we do have to monitor progress. So criterion according to OCR should be measurable and we should be measuring it in some way, but that's as far as they go uh, with that. Uh, also LEA should develop a 504 plan form and never use an IEP form. A lot of uh, school districts sometimes do that, use IEP forms for 504 kids. OCR suggests don't do that because IEP forms are, are much, uh, there's much more in a 50 or IEP than there is a, in a 504 plan. Uh, so OCR suggests IEPs not be used. That you develop an, a 504 plan, and if you do have a 504 plan, should address things like this. There should be a section where it says what is the nature of the student's disability and major life activities. It limits. So that's essentially it's sort of like your present level statement where you're saying. What is the impairment? What are the major life activities and functions? 
what's your basis for determining disabilities, you know, your different tests, and how does the child's disability affect uh, wh th that major life activity of learning or whatever it might be. Then you go on to the necessary, necessary accommodations. How are you going to accommodate that child's needs so you can level, so you do level the playing field? And that includes if the child has problem behavior, that you include a behavior plan. Although it doesn't say behavior intervention plans like IDEA says BIP, it just says have a plan to address behavior included in the 504 plan. Um, there's also an LRE type requirement that you say where the child is placed, but that's normally the general ed setting, and that either committee members are listed or they sign it, or somehow we know who was involved in developing that plan. And IDEA, of course, is very specific about who has to develop an IEP. 504 and OCR are not nearly as specific about who needs to uh, develop the 504 plan. Just going as far as saying it should be a, a team of qualified individuals. Now, here's a couple of other things about the plan. One of the interesting things about 504 is neither five or uh, sex, the law, the statute, or the regulations actually require a 504 plan. But OCR has said you should use one. It's a way of proving your programming for a child. So, what, you know, it wouldn't make any sense not to use one. So, although it's not actually in the law, it's a very good idea to use it. Um, and if you have the accommodations, you want to make sure that your teachers are actually implementing them. So, uh, just like with IDEA, ensure accommodations are implemented. So, whatever accommodations you include in the 504 plan, you want to some you want to ensure that all your teachers know what they have to do to carry out this plan. And I know I've been talking with Matt and everybody about the IEP at a glance, and the idea is kind of the same with 504. There should be some way to communicate to your general ed teachers what they're what they need to be doing to accommodate the child. Because remember, that's one of the major reasons OCR said f schools deny FAPE under 504 is those plans don't get implemented or those accommodations don't get implemented. Um, I had talked er, uh, in, my, in the last session about a plan. We do the same thing in a number of our school districts with 504 only kids. We have a 504 plan and this is not the plan itself, but when we have specific accommodations, um, that goes to the student's teacher and they sign off on it so we know they understand what accommodations they need to make. Um, so for example, we might have accommodations, all tests will be read to the student by a peer professional or teacher. But whatever accommodations we make, we let the teachers read it, sign it, uh, and data. So everybody knows what they need to be doing. Um, we want to make certain that all these accommodations are implemented. So what the 504 flow chart looks like uh, in a school district is this. That we know if, if we suspect a child is a disability under 504, thinking of all those different times that OCR says we need to consider that, we decide that a child should be, should, is possibly eligible to 504, we have to refer them or we can take a parent referral. Uh, and according to our OCR, we should get parent permission to conduct an evaluation. When we do the evaluation, it's essentially to determine if the student has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. activity. So that's the decision. Based on the testing that we do, that's the decision we make. Do they have a major life, act or do they have a uh, impairment that um, affects a major life activity? Now, we always have to remember that 504 protects students from discrimination. And our 504 plan 
is the way we, deter we ensure that we're protecting our students from discrimination in education. So in other words, we're leveling the playing field. Best way to do that, according to OCR, is to develop a Section 504 plan, not to use an IEP, but to have a separate form for 504. And then make certain that we've developed a plan that we think levels the playing field that allows the student to receive an edu education comparable to the education received by non-disabled students. So that's kind of our flow chart. Um, now, does anybody have any questions about that? It, so it kind of looks like IDEA, but there's not nearly the different procedural requirements. You know, it doesn't tell us who exactly has to be on the team. Now, um, one, a huge issue in 504 has to do with discipline of kids. Because you all know uh, the problems of discipline in, uh, with respect to IDEA. There are similar problems with respect to 504. In fact, under 504, you would do well to follow the same disciplinary procedures you use under the individuals, under the IDEA. And um, essentially what discipline says, uh, this is true about discipline, that under 504, and actually under IDEA too, you can pretty much uh, discipline kids with disabilities in the same way as you discipline non-disabled kids um, or non-disabled students. But there are some exceptions that we have to understand. Um, first off, in terms of school-wide discipline plans, many schools have, will have school-wide discipline plans. Um, that's generally a great idea. And students with disabilities are subject, either IDEA, special ed, or 504 only, they're subject to pretty much the same school disciplinary plan with a few exceptions. That is, when any disciplinary procedures deprive students of their special ed or 504 services. Um, when procedures change educational placement or when they interfere with the student's 504 plan. So anytime discipline interferes with an IEP or changes placement or interferes with a 504 plan, that is potentially illegal or a violation of either 504 or the IDEA. Um, and the only real, the only two types of discipline that really go to that extent are long-term suspension and expulsion. That's, in terms of 504, that's pretty much the only prohibitions. You can't expel, you can't use long-term suspension, of course, unless you do a manifestation determination. Now, um, if you as a 504 team determine that the child, the 504 student, is subject to the school-wide discipline plan, as long as it doesn't violate, there's not any violation of Section 504, like your, if your school-wide discipline plan includes expulsion, that couldn't be done with a 504 student. But you can use that school-wide discipline plan to affirm that the student's subject to those. So in other words, you could actually append a school-wide discipline plan to the 504 plan, if, you know, behavior's a concern, and just to, uh, affirm that the fact that the 504 student is subject to the same exact things as any student. And remember, if the 504 student is subject to the same disciplinary procedures as all students, you have no 504 problem, because they're all on the same playing field. They're all in the level playing field now. But the important thing is they all, ha all students have to be subject to the same plan. Now, um, as I said, this is a huge problem with special ed is when suspensions are used and essentially change a child's placement because they're long-term suspended or expulsion is, is used and it changes placement. That's a violation of IDEA. It's also a violation of 504. Um, one of the best ways that school districts can get around the issues of suspension and expulsion is to use in-school discipline. Um, because school officials are least likely to make mistakes uh, regarding uh, expulsion and suspension if they use in-school discipline. 
and apply it evenly to all students, those with and without disabilities. That's the key to making certain that you're not violating 504, is all students are subject to the same plan. Now, if you use in-school discipline, such as an in-school suspension or timeout or detention, something like that, as long as it's used with everyone, it's okay. As long as it's not overly harsh or punitive, it can also be okay. Um, and if it's not used excessively. If the child is not winding up spending more time in the in-school suspension than they are in the general ed setting, it's okay. Uh, so in-school suspension's a good way to avoid some of the problems of 504 suspensions, I mean 504 violation if you suspend kids. Uh, the, in terms of short-term suspensions, exactly the same as 504. OCR has said basically the same thing as with IDEA. Unilateral suspensions or changes of placement for not more than 10 consecutive days are allowed. So, but the 10-day limit in terms of consecutive days is a clear, is a bright line. You can't go over 10 consecutive days because that's a change in placement. And that's, that's, that violates IDEA, violates Section 504. Now, so suspensions of over 10 consecutive days, not allowed. Now, with the exception of if you do a manifestation determination, we'll talk about that in a second. Now, suspensions of more than 10 cumulative days in a school year could also be a change in placement. And after 10 cumulative days uh, of suspension, educational services must be provided. Now, that's really for kids with ID. It's also for 504 kids, although the manifestation determination changes a lot of things. Although that's required for IDEA, required for 504, there's a difference in how that's conducted. Now, multiple short-term suspensions may be a problem. If you're using a, if a, if a, if a child is in school and then they're suspended, they're back in school, they're suspended, they're back in school, they're suspended. In other words, you're using these multiple short-term suspensions. That could also be a change in placement. And you don't want to do that because that could potentially violate IDEA or 504. So the 504 team, or the if you're if you have a if we're on a special ed, the IEP team, but we're talking about 504 kids, so we're talking about the 504 team, you should decide, meet together, decide if those short-term suspensions are amounting to a change in placement. In that case, you're not supposed to do that. And how do you make that decision? Well, you look at the suspensions. How long is the child being removed? Are they real close to each other? Are they for the same type of behavior? Um, in that case, if you're spend, suspending kid over and over again, that could violate Section 504. Um, you can use short-term suspensions, but just with like idea, kids, keep track of them. Um, remember, 10 consecutive days, that's the bright line. Can't go beyond 10 consecutive days, but you could go, you know, you can suspend, bring a school back, child back in, or you can suspend for a short term, under 10 days, but just kind of be careful about them. Um, they should only be used in emergencies. Um, schools should keep, someone in the school, the principal or your 504 coordinator should be keeping records of the amount of time a child is out, uh, the total days of suspensions, uh, because if that is excessive, you may be violating 504, because that may be indication that you have a bad 504 plan if you're using suspensions a lot. And of course, expulsions are what are called per se changes in placement. They're per se meaning automatic. If you expel a child, it's an automatic change of placement uh, because it lasts longer than 10 consecutive days. Expulsion is a child is out of school for the rest of the school year, for example. That's a change in placement under IDEA, so you can't do it. It's a change of placement under 504, and you're not supposed to do it either. So that could be a violation. Um, now, here's, here's where 504 and IDEA differ. 
um, children with disabilities under IDEA, you should never even, even think about expulsion. They have to, you have to continue providing educational services. 504 children, if they are expelled through the manifestation process, and they are, you decide there's no relationship, they can be expelled. Now, if it's an IDEA student and you expel them, you can do that under the manifestation if there's no relationship, but you must continue educational services, which include working on the goals, which includes providing all related services, um, and allowing them to be involved in the general ed curriculum, although in a different setting. So in other words, you have to continue providing pretty significant educational services if you go to expulsion. With, uh, with 504 kids, if they're properly expelled, you can treat them like a general ed kid. You could expel them and not provide services. So that's where the kind of expulsion thing differs with 504 only students. Now, what doesn't differ is if we're moving to a long-term suspension or an expulsion, we have to do a manifestation determination. And the manifestation determination, that whole concept actually comes from 504. Because remember, what 504 says is we have, to keep, we have to treat, we cannot discriminate against kids solely on their basis of their disability. So let's say if uh, you're a teacher, or no, let's say you go back to my example of the sixth graders going to the state capitol in Minnesota. Let's say you brought a child who's visually impaired and he bumped into a statue and broke it, a very expensive statue. Would you, would you suspend the child for that? No, because visual impairment, that's his disability. It's related to his disability. Well, that's where the whole idea of manifestation determination came in, is we can't expel or suspend kids long term for behavior that's related to their disability. Um, what we have to do instead, if we're bound determined to use long term suspension or even expulsion, we have to assemble a group of knowledgeable persons to conduct manifestation determination. That's essentially the 504 team. Collect your evaluation data, the data on the child's misbehavior, and based on that, you have to determine it was the behavior in question related to the child's disability. If you decide there was a relationship between the disability and the misbehavior, you cannot use long-term suspension or expulsion under 504. Of course, you can't under IDEA either, but you can't under 504. However, if you decide there's no relationship between the misconduct in question and the disability, you could use long-term suspension and expulsion. Now, if as a child with disability, you have to continue to provide all educational services, if a child 504 child only, that is level then, and it's done with every child. I'm not the manifestation determination, but expulsion is used with every child. Then you could use it with a child 504 child too, and you wouldn't have to provide the educational services. That's the big difference in terms of discipline. Now, in actually conducting the uh, determination, it's same thing. We have the team has to get together. We have to collect and review the relevant assessment data, including data regarding or regarding the actual misconduct in question. We have to look at the 504 plan, and we have to ask ourselves, or the team has to answer two questions. Was the conduct in question caused by or had a direct and substantial relationship to the child's disability? And two, was the conduct in question the direct result of the school district's failure to implement the 504 plan. So in other words, if you determine there was a behavior plan in the 504 plan, there's behavior that wasn't addressed appropriately, that's an automatic, uh, that's an auto automatic relationship then. If the district didn't implement the 504 plan as written, that is an automatic manifestation.
No, but if the answer to the question is, no, there wasn't a direct and substantial relationship, but I should have said, but yes, the 504 plan was implemented, then you, then you can say there was no relationship. So that's the manifestation determination. It's really not an idea. I don't know why courts started applying this to idea, but they did. But it's really a 504 issue because you're talking about discrimination. If you discipline a kid for behavior that is caused by their disability, you're discriminating against a child. That's why we have to do the manifestation determination. Now, uh, another issue that differs with respect to IDEA kids and 504 kids are FBAs and, and uh, our functional behavioral assessments and behavior intervention plans. We know IDEA and Article 7 require those be done in certain situations. The f neither the, law, the statute nor the regulations on 504 require FBAs or BIPs. However, we have to address the behavior in the IEP, but it doesn't say anything about a behavior intervention plan separate from the importance of addressing, addressing the behavior, I mean, in the 504 plan. And just because they're not mentioned doesn't mean it's not good practice to do FBAs and BIPs. It just means I, that 504 says nothing about that. Now, uh, we talked earlier a little about alcohol and drug offenses. Um, with or without a causal link, students whose misbehavior involves the use of alcohol or illegal drugs, and those are defined in the law as not, not uh, cigarettes or things like that, but narcotics and, and drugs, those students may be disciplined for use or possession in the same way as non-disabled students are. So if, if they're if a child is abusing drugs or alcohol, they're, you know, they're selling it on the school grounds, they are possessing it, then you can discipline 504 only students in the same way as you discipline students, whatever your procedure your district use for disciplining non-disabled students. That's not true of IDEA students because they have these additional rights and procedural safeguards. So in essence, what OCR has said and though this is kind of a point of contentions, is students who commit alcohol drug offenses are not protected under 504. No manifestation determination is needed. So if you, would, if you expel general ed kids for drug offenses, you can expel 504 only kids for drug offenses. You can't do that with IDEA kids though. So. Some particular ways OCR has, has said that schools are likely to violate the disciplinary procedures of 504 are using disciplinary procedures with students with disabilities that are not used with non-disabled students. So then again, that's, we don't have a level playing field. We use discipline with kids with disabilities. We don't use it with kids without disabilities. That's pretty much an automatic uh, violation because that's discriminatory. Using discipline, discipline procedures with students with disabilities that are more harsh than those used with non-disabled students. That is discrimination. Again, if you're treating them all the same, that's okay for 504 students. Suspending, expelling, or changing placement of a student with disabilities for misconduct that is related to his or her disability you can't do that unless drug or alcohol problem. Using disciplinary procedures that are prohibited in a student's 504 plan. So if your plan says the expulsion cannot be used, you cannot use it with a 504 student. So does it, now that's kind of the discipline piece. It, there, it's very similar to IDEA with respect to we can use the same school-wide disciplinary plan with all students, but in terms of suspension, um, we have that 10-day limit thing. That's true of 504. Uh, we have the manifestation determination. The only thing is, the, only di the big difference is, if a child is, is not, there's no relationship, you can suspend long-term or s expel 504-only students without providing services. You, that is not true of special ed students. 
Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay, let's go on to uh, another area that has really uh, been big lately. Uh, we've seen a lot of OCR decisions on that, and that's the provision of, not, of non academic services to youngsters with disabilities because the law, remember, is about leveling the playing field. Students with disabilities must be provided with an equal opportunity to participate in non academic services and extracurricular activities. That's true of IDEA kids, too. They must have an equal opportunity to participate. Recreational athletics, counseling services, health services, special interest groups. Now, where the area of real dispute has come in is in sports participation. A number, about three years ago, OCR issued an opinion in which they said no qualified student with a disability can be denied the opportunity to participate in physical education and athletic activities. Well, that's, there's nothing wrong with that, but the way it was interpreted is people were saying, that means kids with 504 have to be on, they have to have either be on school teams or have equivalent teams for students with disabilities. And there was a whole ruckus raised on that, and OCR put out a couple more memorandum on it. Essentially, they said, that school districts, coaches, cannot prejudge a student's participation in athletics. And what they meant by that is if you have after school athletics, and it was taken, uh, this was from, it was actually from an OCR case on a, a young woman who wanted to participate in track. And the young woman was profoundly deaf, and the, sta the state's high school athletic rules required that all track events be started with a starting pistol, with an auditory signal. Boom, they all go running. Well, this girl could not hear. And so what the school did is um, they didn't allow this child, the, the young woman, to participate in the sport, the, in track, because they allowed her to uh, participate in training, but they wouldn't let her participate in the meets. And the parent filed a complaint with OCR, and OCR said, no, that child has to be allowed to participate. Because you can make some very non-fundamental changes to track meets. What you could do, and this seems to make sense, is have an auditory signal and also a visual signal when a race starts. But the school said, but the state athletic commission doesn't allow that. And they said, uh-uh, the State Athletic Commission, they would be violating Section 504. They have to make those non-fundamental allowances for the child to be able to participate. And so OCR said, let her run track. Now here was another thing that happened, is that because of that, people seem to get the mistaken un impression that students with disabilities must be allowed to be on sports teams. And OCR said no. They must be allowed to try out for sports teams. They must be allowed to participate. But there are certain skill sets that all kids have to meet, general ed kids, students with disabilities, in order to participate in sports. And so therefore, the only requirement of school districts is you allow students to participate in tryouts, if they don't have the skills to make it, that's not discrimination because that is what's true of non-disabled kids. So, in other words, you don't have to ensure that kids w with disabilities make the sports team. You just have to allow them to try out for it. Um, but there are other problems that arise with athletics and that has to do with uh, schools prejudging kids, like I said, with a track thing, although she clearly had the skills. She was a very skillful run runner and did qualify, was one of the faster students in the school, but they just said she couldn't because the school, the state athletic rules. But there have been situations where students were not allowed to participate. Um, and I can think of one, a, a student was not allowed to, a, 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 young woman with Down syndrome, not allowed to try out for 
cheerleading. The school kind of prejudged. They said, well, she doesn't have the coordination. She can't make it. Uh, so they just didn't allow her to. OCR said, that's a violation. You have to allow them to try out. You do, they, you, again, if she did, they don't have the skill set to make the team. That's OK. But you just have to allow them to try out. Um, one exception to that is when there's a safety risk. Uh, there was a child, I don't know why this would happen, but there was a child with a, and I always forget the name of it, it's a bone disorder that, that uh, called brittle bone disorder. A young guy wanted to try out for the wrestling team, and he had this brittle bone disorder. And the school said, absolutely not. You're, that's a dangerous situation for this child. And they, there was a complaint filed with OCR, and they agreed. They said, oh yeah, there's some real risks there. Safety comes first. So that was a legitimate thing to do, reason to not allow the child to try out. But most of the time, we just have to understand, you allow them to try out, they don't automatically have to make the team. And I, I remember um, uh, reading about a Section 504 plan where a school district wrote in the child was going to be quarterback on their high school team. Well, that just doesn't make sense because they would have to be able to be a good, you know, have the skill set to be a quarterback. So sports participation kind of was a big, big issue for a little while. OCR just essentially said this, can't prejudge a student's participation in athletics. You got to let them try out. You can then, if they don't make it, they don't make it. Courts generally favor allowing qualified athletics with physical disabilities to participate, like the young woman in track, as long as you make a non-fundamental change that allows the girl to participate. There was a, a, another case out of o, OCR where uh, uh, it, was a, it was a young man who was a very good swimmer, but I can't remember what it was, but there was something about, he had, I think, only a part, partial arm, and one of the things he couldn't, and he's still a very good swimmer, and he made the team, but one of the things he couldn't do was that thing where they kick off and they go under, and there was an OCR complaint saying they have to make changes, they have to allow them to do that. OCR's ruling was no, that would be a fundamental change of the activity because that would give them a real advantage, and so that wasn't required because that was a fundamental change, whereas just having a visual signal, an auditory signal, that's not a fundamental change. So part, sports participation was a big deal. It's kind of died down now. But there's, if anybody's interested, by the way, if you just Google OCR guidance, you'll get to the home page of the Department of Education where they have a lot of these guidance letters available. And they're not like law, but they're what OCR says, this is what we think you need to do as a school district to meet the law. Another issue um, that's kind of a big deal is retaliation. 504 um, does prohibit retaliation. Well, what that means is retaliation is any time um, there's coercion or intimidation or threat against a person for the purpose of interfering with the exercise of a protected right. Evalu uh, retaliation is illegal under federal and state laws. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act prohibits discrimination based on an individual's disability. We know that. But it also prohibits a retaliation for the exercise of rights. Uh, and so uh, occasionally you'll read a parent saying, the school district tried to retaliate by giving my child bad grades because I was trying to get them to give them some 504 modifications. Or you'll have a teacher, and this, this actually was a huge case in 504. Uh, now I'll tell you about the case, it was out of Portland. It was called Settle Good versus Portland City School District. And it was a, it was a now her last name was very appropriate, Settle Good. What happened is, uh, Pamela Selgood was an adaptive PE teacher hired by the Portland School District, noticed that kids with 504 plans and IEPs who had adaptive PE had PE one day a week, where all the other kids had PE five days a week. Well, you see, we got a pretty unlevel playing field there, right? Furthermore, she noticed that the school district was changing 504 plans um, to uh, give them adaptive PE. 
PE, but only uh, one, day, one day a week. And she reported that to the special ed director. And she did that a couple times. And the special ed director said, well, this might be a real problem, referred it to the superintendent. Superintendent wrote Pamela Settle good a letter and said, stop doing that. Don't write letters that say we're violating the law and didn't stop Pam Settlegood. She saw what she thought were really bad situations. She kept writing letters so the superintendent uh, fired her. Not only did he fire her, but he talked to all his superintendent friends and essentially blackballed her from the Portland City School District. She couldn't get a job. She then sued under 504, and the thing about 504, unlike IDEA, there's punitive damages under 504, and any attorney, their eyes will light up when they hear punitive damages, because that's where the real money is. Um, Pamela Settlegood took them to court, took the superintendent in the school district, actually the school district to court, because she had been retaliated against in violation of section 504, went to a jury trial, who found that they had, in fact, retaliated against uh, Pamela Settlegood, and she settled for $25 million from the school district because it was proven that the superintendent had not only fired her in retaliation, but blackballed her from the, from the, from the school district in Portland. $25 million. Uh, now that not going to happen a lot, but that's just an example of how serious retaliation can be under Section 504. So as parents, as teachers, as special ed directors, as counselors, as school psychologists, if we see problems occurring that we believe are violating the law, we need to point those out to the people who can make, make changes and, and make certain that those problems go away that they're dealt with appropriately. And that's the same thing with the bullying issue right now that I was talking about earlier today. The problems, school districts that have really had problems, and there have been some big settlements for bullying, is when the, a court or a judge or a hearing officer determines that the school district deliberately covered up something or, deliber or, or didn't do something to stop the situation, but they knew about it. That's when problems occur. So if we see problems occurring, we essentially want to do something about it. If it's bullying, we want to investigate, we want to stop the bullying. If it's retaliation, we want to make certain that that doesn't happen. If there's a situation like Pamela Settlegood saw where all kids with disabilities were getting one hour a week of PE and everybody else was getting five hours a week, and you realize that's not a level playing field, you need to point that out. You need to... Uh, do something or contact people that are in a position to solve or take care of that issue. Uh, those are, are the big procedural responsibilities uh, that I was, uh, was going to talk about. But not that complicated. Um, just remember we have to have someone in charge in our school district. Thank you so much.